Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Cosm Podcast. I'm your host, Tyler James Berger, and in this episode, I sit down with Alex Gray for a special audio-only dialogue exploring psychedelics, eco-consciousness, and visionary art. You can check out this segment on Cosm's YouTube channel, which features a montage of art and imagery relative to the conversation. Enjoy. What role do you think psychedelics can play in healing humanity's relationship with nature? And how have you portrayed this in your art? I think many people who have taken psychedelics in uh, you know numerous environments have discovered, first of all, that they may need to address healing within themselves. And... Um, once they start to address and heal some of the major wounds and things and they start to recover a sense of sacredness and a sense of an order beyond their ego and things like that that is a profound and uh, an ultimate mystery you know until you start to touch the mystery i think that one is kind of baffled by the world and lost and uh, so I think that the discovery of a kind of divine order within oneself you know when we relax into the magical mondo is somehow our consciousness becomes fused with an infinite now it's probably always fused with an infinite we're just not aware of the presence of the infinite that is always here and so at special times when we be alter our consciousness and become aware of, of that which always is you know but but is experienced as a revelation then we start to uh, look at the world and our lives and the people around us as reflections of that divine order. And we start to see the sacredness uh, of relationships that we cultivate and relationships that we move away from and, and how our spiritual path is kind of unfolding before us. And so... Once we get on that path and we start to really try, the only way to the to a sense of healing within is by becoming true w within oneself and to start to look at difficult truths all around oneself. And so I think the biggest obvious truth that's being uh, ignored in the world today is the relationship we have with the earth as a human species you know the tragic slaughtering really of species and things at our own ignorance in the way that we've befouled our planet which is our only home and so at any rate I you know one can't help but have a sense of sadness uh, and about the um, gravity of our ignorance but the the beautiful possibility of our awakening which is always present in the highest of the psychedelic mystical experiences that promise of awakening and the promise of transformation is something that gives us the um, wherewithal to face whatever we're going to face, you know, and to believe in this divine order that we saw deep within us and we see reflected in us in the cosmos and in the intricate intelligence in nature throughout nature on all levels you know Terence McKenna kind of distinguished himself by 
advocating more for the shamanic compounds and things, and wh which uh, directly partakes of the Earth's cosmic intelligence. You know, it's kind of great that God decided not to hide religion in the tongues of humans, but to put it in a mushroom, and then <laughs> we could discover it. Uh, time and again, not having to decode the myths and uh, folklore of cultures past, but we could see that we're minting our own, you know, as uh, we evolve as a species, you know, we have new circumstances that were never faced before and new opportunities in the face of those uh, perhaps dangers, you know, that we should be awakening to. And I think that psychedelics have been great catalysts to many people's eco-consciousness or the beginnings of their sense of being part of the whole, you know, part of the infinite one that is the world around us and we can become separated from that we can forget our oneness there's an algonquin word wetiko or uh wendigo as well it's um it's this idea of a type of soul sickness that comes from a separation from nature uh this is an observation that uh, the Algonquin made when they saw the European colonialists come to the New World. They thought that these people had a type of soul sickness yes. by, by the way they were um, relating to the natural world. And it seems like this is a, it's a manifestation of a disconnection from this, this idea of our sacred relationship with nature. And it seems psychedelics can help us remember that. Yes, absolutely. I think that's one of the great promises. And of course, that was Albert Hoffman's great hope as well. You know, um, he spoke of it in one of his last uh, great addresses to the world at the age of 101 mm -hmm. on Bicycle Day. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, and so many people in, in psychedelic culture have awakened to the immense gift and majesty that is the natural world. And, you know, Terrence McKenna had made the comment that these plant-based psychedelics could be a type of chemical language that Gaia uses to speak to the monkeys, you know, to, to keep the monkeys on track. Absolutely, and when we forgot to take our medicine, it really uh, took a shaman lady to wake us up. Mm -hmm. You know, Maria Sabina, we have to thank for the the great an awakening of the shamanic medicine of psilocybin, which has apparently been part of many sacred ceremonies throughout the world, you know, um, from uh, the you know, the Himalayas, uh, where um, Claudia Mueller Eberling and Christian Ratch went traveling uh, in the Himalayas, I think in Nepal, and they met a shaman there uh, that spoke of the psilocybin mushrooms that grow in the uh, that area. And uh, he called, when uh, Christian uh, pulled them out he said yes these are traveling mushrooms you know so the shamans there and the shamans around the world have been familiar with these uh, plants as evidently were some of the ancient cultures so now it's becoming part of our uh, awareness which has become gravely alienated from our interconnectedness with our planet how out of kilter do you have to be 
to see the uh, the kind of destruction that's been going on and still have denial about mm-hmm. the nature of the climate change and and the uh, really environmental destruction and practices that go around around yeah. us. So it's the, almost like psychedelic withdrawal symptoms in a way. Um, you know the the kind of the destruction, the destructive aspects of our society. You know, Timothy Leary said in a hilarious way that psychedelics cause psychosis in all those who don't take them. Yeah, <laughs> hysteria. Hysteria. Yeah, right. Because mm. he was um, seeing reflected around him, you know, tremendous alarm in people who would not and did not take them or see how they'd been curing alcoholics, how they'd been uh, helping people with depression and things like that. Um, You know, somehow the message of that got uh, blurred, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, for a political purpose, unfortunately, you know, we've been living in the wake of those uh, mistakes. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, if we can base our our uh, understanding on truth. Science has been giving us some understanding of that psychedelic healing is a true thing and is a real thing. It's not something that should be demonized. It's something that should be reestablished into the, uh, the human flow and understanding so that we try to grapple with this sacred dimension. I think that that's been one of the most profoundly troubling uh, things. Aldous Huxley really tried to get people to start to address this universal spirituality that uh, is our profound possibility and also leads to an understanding, a natural understanding of the, um, the, the beauty and intelligence and uh, divine order reflected throughout nature and a natural respect for uh, nature and for the all the creatures Uh, and and so um, certainly the native people most of the shamanic tribes have lived in harmony with nature for for you know millennia Mm -hmm. and so uh, so yes this is the kind of emergency medicine you know that is now called for Mm -hmm. And a lot of these, they seem to be pathologies of the ego. You know, it's the ego that separates us and gives us an individual identity. But if we don't occasionally dissolve the ego or expand our ego, uh, the eco-psychologist Theodore Rosak, in one of my favorite quotes, he says that if the self can be expanded to include the natural world, then any behavior leading to the destruction of the world will be experienced as self-destruction. So, so much of the way we can justify our behavior towards the uh, the natural world is because we feel we are separate from it. It it doesn't, it feels like, you know, it's over there. It's not in our house. But if we can expand our sense of self to include Gaia, to include nature, then when we're destroying nature, we are in a way destroying ourselves. And it's because we have this disconnect that we don't personally feel like we're in any trouble. But if we can re-identify with, I love the term you so often use, the life web. You know, it is a web. We are, we are part of a network. We are so intricately interconnected with this network. And everything we do ripples out into it there is no separation absolutely and that's the i think the understanding that is common in the great mystical teachings and in the psychedelic experience you know that we're seamlessly interwoven with a web of intelligence and uh, materiality uh, manifested uh, in a magical display that we're able to contemplate. I mean, do we need a bigger miracle than that? Mm-hmm. I mean, that it's even possible to do that. Uh, I, I mean, to my mind, it, you know, that shows a, a great conceit if you need a bigger magical show. You know, I mean, really? I mean, really? Oh, you need more fireworks uh, than 
than the ongoing miracle of everyday existence. God's gone to quite some uh, trouble, I'd say, to evolve the world to this extent, Mm -hmm. you know, and to uh, make the natural order uh, so complex and so interwoven, so finely interwoven. I like that uh, Paul Stamets, another wonderful mushroom man, likes to imagine that psilocybin is a way for us also to get in touch with the mind of nature Mm -hmm. that it's not only nature is providing this so that uh but we're we're seeking it as well you know how do we expand our sense of self like rosak was talking about so that we might ever be able to imagine uh, a sense of a a planetary self Mm -hmm. And nevertheless, I think that it's natural and inherent in the uh, sort of the human uh, and like any uh, animal is to feel instinctually embedded in their environment. Mm -hmm. And we have an earthly body and our earthly body is only possible within a culture and within an earthly environment. And Mm -hmm. so... Uh, taking care of that environment and taking, um, you know, a, a mindful nature about it. It's a, uh, it gives us the opportunity to expand into our, into our wholeness. And when we take responsibility for it, like uh, in our little uh, imagining of what Entheon uh, might be or Cosm might take on, you know, we were often thinking that we would, Maybe we should invest in a brownfield, you know, in a poisoned environment, you know, and then somehow our task would be to extract the poison and that Mm -hmm. uh, today we have a desacralized environment, you know, Mm -hmm. and we have to address how are we going to bioremediate. And uh, Paul has uh, demonstrated that the fungi have uh, some ideas about how Mm -hmm. to help in that regard. And... Uh, if we have a different mind about our soil and about the intelligence already woven throughout nature, you know, and work with it instead of against it, that, that uh, you know, this is one of the ways that we can expand our intelligence into the intelligence around us mm-hmm. and get a sense of that order and recover the sacredness of that order. Yeah, yeah. in service to it. Yes. Um, and a word that I really love that was popularized by the sociologist Edward Wilson is biophilia, Mm -hmm. the love for nature and the love for life. He talks about biophilia as something intrinsic to organisms that the animals feel a love for other animals and just the whole life web. Yes. The life web is a love web. (laughs) Yes, totally. It's the, uh, it is a reflection of that divine order of the love that is timeless and you know imperishable and here is a temporary residence uh but gets to show uh the rich beauty and diversity of uh, you know how life can dwell at every temperature and uh you know it simply needs to evolve and adapt to a new body Mm -hmm. you know so the the body you know, has taken on such plasticity in God's evolutionary hands. Yeah. And another way we can kind of extend our sense of self is by extending it into the past and into the future, by which I mean, I'm wearing a shirt with your drawing, the (laughs) the great chain of staring down the great chain of being. Hmm. And it is so fascinating to look at the amazing miraculous journey that life has been on on this planet we started as single cell organisms in a primordial soup and now we're sitting down with microphones wondering you know how it all went wrong (laughs) (laughs) but now and, and to extend into the future there's this idea of making all your choices and all your actions in light of the seventh generation to totally to act in light of you know, maybe the majesty of all that came before you and with respect with all that will come after you. Um, I think this is a way of kind of extending the self temporally 
you know, to extend <sighs> backwards and forwards in time. So important. And this is native intelligence, actually, you know. Yeah. And so, uh, so I think it's, it's interesting how much recovery of native intelligence, mm -hmm. the consideration of the seventh generation, and that soul is connected to the seventh generation. That soul is connected to the generations before it. It sees the sacred landscape. It sees the sacred landscape of the soul that is part of this earth and uh, is also part of heaven. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, that one see the heaven that earth is, you know, uh, to recover its uh, sacredness is what I call the second coming. Mm -hmm. You know, that, uh, you know, I talk about the green Jesus sometime or the green Mary, you know, that this uh, same kind of verdant greenness that um, Hildegard of Bingen, you know, mm -hmm. the... 12th century abbess talked about this greening power of Christ. So she identified, just like the Greek uh, civilization identifies Persephone with the return of, of spring, you know, so the goddess uh, or God energy in this sense uh, of Hildegard regarding the Christ energy, the Christing, you know, uh, the anointing of nature is this return of life. Mm. It's the return of love, the return of life. You know, the, Persephone represents that too. She's the return of nature and love. The blush of spring uh, starts returns. You know, you can feel beautiful again. You know, it's, the things start to look beautiful and less skeletal and mm -hmm. things like that in nature. And yeah. so, uh, there's an identification of of the God that comes alive uh, in this and in this verdancy. You know, and greenness that is the rebirthing power that the, the solar power that is uh, embraced on earth and rises up like the seed, you know, and uh, the anti-gravitational urgency toward the light is, is what the Christ figure uh, or the Persephone figure uh, represents. And that greening power, uh, you know, if Christ in the first coming was a representation of how divinity and humanity are, are fused. I think of the second coming as the revelation that divinity and nature mm -hmm. are one. Yeah. And, and so it has to be a green uh, second coming or there is no... Uh, <laughs> totally. <laughs> yeah. We need to reconnect the divinity of nature with the health of nature. There's a wetlands. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so to speak, mm -hmm. you know, where uh, I, I think of that as the separation between the, the, the symbol, which is spirit identified mm -hmm. with pure spirit in the ideal realm and somewhat disconnected, but resonant with and the material uh, reflection mm -hmm. of that ideal form. What is interfusing them mm -hmm. is soul stuff. That's the wetlands. Mm. That's the mind. That's the psyche. That's where all of this interfusing and resolution uh, comes about. And I think that we have to see the soul of nature, uh, which is the energetic ecosystem that is everything we can see and mm -hmm. analyze. And uh, it says it's sick. And so we need to pay attention to that before it's <laughs> impossible to fix. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the sounding the arm is important. And we have to recognize that there are certain things that are going to happen. And we're going to witness them. Scientists have forewarned them for decades. So they're coming about. And uh, so the uh, question is whether uh, the kinds of, you know, grave, you know, destructions will happen or whether we will uh, wise up. And so it's, it's kind of the great turn uh, that for humanity, I, I feel like I, you know, uh, Allison says that everyone has always felt apocalyptic no matter what age they lived in, you know, no, you know, someone was saying, you know, the, uh, the second coming is, is right around the corner or mm -hmm. something, you know. And, and so uh, there's always been this sense of it, but I think today we've figured out how to do it. 
Mm-hmm. And so it's a lot more achievable and therefore more frightening and more real. Mm-hmm. And so demanding of our attention. If we can uh, steer the wheel even a few degrees, you know, by our consciousness, mm-hmm. you know, and recover uh, some of the web, you know, and uh, figure out carbon capture and uh, f- and make it a real thing. You know, we've talked to uh, Matt Atwood, who's really an amazing uh, eco-scientist, uh, but he devised simple devices that uh, would extract carbon directly from the atmosphere. And, uh, you know, it's a matter of producing these machines, and it's uh, a matter of reducing the uh, oil uh, that is burning and some of the other uh, polluting technologies that we Mm -hmm. have. So it's going to change habits. And I think that just like uh, the pandemic has shown, humanity is capable of it. Humanity is capable of transforming habits, you know. Yeah, and because we are capable, we are responsible. And, you know, I love your piece, Eco Atlas, because it really kind of expresses this this weight that kind of sits on the shoulders of humanity, this, this kind of responsibility we have that with our kind of newfound stewardship, uh, this, this role, this this immense responsibility we have for the life web. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about that piece and what inspired you to create it. Um, I think that it was during a uh, meditation, a vision practice on evoking the world spirit. They're usually kind of ecstatic and beautiful, uplifting, angelic kinds of moments for me. But this one was particularly, I felt the gravity of it. And because I, I had my, my brain had become the, the planet. So I thought, well, that's cool. You know, like you need eco consciousness, you know, but then, oh man, as soon as you, you feel like you have a mental disease because <laughs> the earth is out of balance, you know, you, your brain is getting cooked. So I felt the, instantly like the gravity of the world is on everyone's shoulders the more that they realize it if we're conscious and we're alive and certainly in any of the civilized societies and things like that we make an ecological impact you know with practically everything we do and so uh there's some way that we can become more conscious of that and more responsible for our, you know, treatment of the life web and love web. And in a, in a sense, uh, see how fragile uh, it really is. The, this idea of a person holding up something very uh, heavy and things like that, that looks like it's really not uh, sustainable, you know, really. Uh, of course, he's out in space. I mean, it's really an anti-gravitational environment, you know, so there isn't any danger. It's, this is just a symbol, mm. obviously. And the, the kneeling is a um, representation of a sacred kind of position that you take to Isis. Isis is the earth, the goddess. And uh, so in this kind of earth, arms upraised and head bowed uh, and kneeling, there is a, a representation of ISIS. So this is obviously what I, I think we need to return to, you know, had this green consciousness, a sense of, uh, of the divine mother uh, that is nature of Gaia, uh, who's under stress. And uh, so, you know, the, the earth there is filled with eyes, you see. Mm-hmm. And they have their eyes on humanity, actually. Yeah, that's one of my favorite subtle details about yeah. this piece. Yeah, they, it's like, so there's a lot of eyes on us, you mm-hmm. know, of the creatures around us, and a lot of them are, are uh, sad eyes, too. So we have to be conscious, and uh, that's what it calls. Yeah, and, and I think one of your most iconic pieces that really um, hits on this dividing time we find ourselves at is Gaia. It's such a kind of accentuation of the bad and the good. 
can you tell us a little bit about about this piece and and how you were feeling when this image came into your vision um yeah it's hard to see it it's it's like really uh weirdly prophetic in ways that are frightening um i didn't even know when i painted it i painted it in 1989 it was really based on a vision that happened the day our daughter was born Mm -hmm. and uh so that was uh, November 15th, 1988. Yeah. And uh, that's interesting to know. Uh, we mentioned how this kind of conscious new consciousness comes about when we think about the next generation. That's right. You know, so. So, yeah, not seems, even the seventh generation, yeah, but like the just the, one. just the next one here. Mm-hmm. And there's a there's a crack in the painting, a, a dividing line in the in the painting uh, that is right down the center. So. Gaia is under stress. Gaia, the great tree uh, mother, is under stress. The, the, from roots to the uh, limbs. Now, on the one side, it looks more like Boulder, Colorado or something. Uh, you know, with uh, the web of nature seem, or Africa or something, you know, like getting along and uh, all the animals and people and stuff like that. A guy that looks like, a lot like Al Gore with a beard is a bringing vegetables uh, for dinner, I think, to the mother in the cave there. Mm-hmm. And a whole eco-conscious hand is basically putting itself up saying, halt ye forces of evil destruction and things like that, which were personified by this kind of um, diseased phallus. Mm-hmm. And uh, someone looks weirdly like George Bush embracing a terrorist now they're on the one side and the the vegetarian uh, hand up raised is on the other so. mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, somehow we gotta we gotta work out this uh, standoff really mm-hmm. and uh, of these forces of survival and really like the the forces of life uh, which are just returning they're 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 just like powerful and all you need to do is is uh, not pollute you know and uh, there a lot can be recovered you know there's uh, there's certainly harm that has been done to the environment that al- already that we will be wrestling with and generations ahead will be wrestling with you know if we simply recover from our industrial age and don't take ourselves down you know we're going to have a really magical uh, I think hundred thousand next few hundred thousand years. Imagine that, mm-hmm. you know. Imagine the kinds of space travel, intergalactic exploration, and things like that. We could be a uh, a base in the uh, galactic federation of of beings or something, you know. And the Earth, which we know is a treasure, mm-hmm. you know, we can try to recover as much of the life web as we can, and we will always be the green treasure, the blue planet. You know, what a what an outrageous uh, thing that we exist at all, really. I think there's nowhere else in the universe like Earth, mm-hmm. you know, even though there are probably plenty of other uh, living species, even uh, some resembling us. I, mm-hmm. I still think that Earth must be an amazing, amazing place. Yeah. To bring up another one of your pieces that I think is a great rendition of what it feels like to kind of reconnect to this um, sacredness of nature is tree in person. Oh yeah. Uh, You know, it's this amazing connecting of energetic bodies. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, this image and and what inspired it? Well, I think I was uh, thinking very almost physically like a, I don't know, medical illustrator, I guess of the, um, what if, uh, energy fields around living things were a science which it is not i don't think it's more like the wetlands of the soul yeah you know it's kind of where medicine and healing and things like that like kind of get all mushy and things like that so but subtle energy fields i think are are really a thing and uh, whether we understand them or not. And I think they're certainly electromagnetic, but uh, bioelectromagnetic fields mm-hmm. is something that uh, is being affected by our uh, bioelectric field environment. And so a tree is a living thing, 
and has a biofield. And so I was trying to envision the biofield of a tree, which not only would have its uh, root system kind of glowing, in a sense, like an aura around it, uh, and like humanity, uh, quite a number of clairvoyants talk about, well, to use gross language, I guess, uh, the etheric uh, body, which is the close-by body, maybe about a, a it stands about an inch away from the uh, norm flesh figure, mm-hmm. and uh, we're enveloped in this uh, kind of biofield. This biofield, though, is a temporal uh, kind of field. It, it dies with the physical body. Uh, it's part of the uh, astral and emotional field and mm. uh, multiple kind of sheaths and things like that. Uh, the, the Hindu, the, and the Egyptian, all, all kinds of uh, cultural systems have mm. these inter kind of, you know, the Egyptian uh, mummies are within uh, multiple kinds of uh, cases and things like that. They correspond to the different kinds of celestial and astral body and things like that, you mm-hmm. know, reduced uh, auras and things like that around the body. And so, likewise, uh, we all carry around these kind of shells of like uh, atmospheres, in a sense, uh, of selfhood. And uh, clairvoyants who are really perceptive might uh, even perceive thought forms and things floating in your bio field and things like that uh, but the earth uh, the the tree and all things growing here all creatures and everything would have a bio field as well because mm-hmm. everything that's alive would and so uh you know how many orders of celestial bodies and things like that i i have no idea you know but mm-hmm. i i think that birds and things that's why i've uh done that in many of the kinds of uh, nature uh, paintings that I've done, uh, just to give a sense of the life field. And here, like the cardinal, is uh, singing the primordial, uh, the song of primordial perfection, which is the ah Mm -hmm. there in the heart. The cardinal is a uh, Ohio bird, and uh, so I think of it as my own state bird, it's got the Buckeyes there, uh, and uh, so it's got uh, some references. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, there's so many ways that uh, kind of nature communicates with itself. There yeah. are some people who speculate that uh, the vibrations created from bird song help open the stomata in the leaves of the trees that helps wow. chlorophyll pass through. Uh, it's it's this symbiosis. Um, and I just love the way you portray some of this stuff in your work. I think um, lilac is a really interesting piece showing just the a deep appreciation for um, the the nectar of nature, you know? Yeah, the, the... don't you love to smell lilacs? Mm-hmm. I mean, there's something magical about when they come out in abundance. Yeah. I'm like, why? What is the point of that, you know? But it's God in abundance, you know? It's the glory and beauty of of nature. Like, it's obscenely gorgeous, mm-hmm. you know? Uh, flowers just all over the place, draped all over. So, and you see that kind of, opulent beauty reflected in the creatures Mm -hmm. and so uh and trees and all kinds of things but lilacs are just so uh, so the the person then becomes all purple and everything inside Mm -hmm. too yeah it's emerging you know (laughs) it's it's biophilia too you have to think like why that's right it, it, it there has to be some kind of evolutionary advantage to be struck by the beauty and just the aesthetic pleasure of the fragrance of a flower why would that even evolve in the first place if it did not confer some kind of advantage it's true and it uh well i think that i don't know uh you could say that god is conspiring to make us happy you know in a case like that you know that there are so many opportunities placed all around us if Mm. we weren't in our heads thinking that we were looking around our, our the ground even, you know. Like I was amazed uh, when we came to this property and picked up a bunch of leaves and there were all these warts all over. I thought like, oh, these trees are diseased, oh God, you know, and things like that. But then I learned that actually, no, they had been galled 
that there were gall wasps that uh, came around and would lay there, just like you were saying that the trees are listening. Mm-hmm. They're listening to the birds and they're saying, okay, I guess there's enough birds. We could open our uh, leaves now. We could send out the buds, you know? And so, so there's a kind of synchrony and uh, harmony. And the birds you, you see almost have a, this purpose, you know? They are calling it forward. You don't want to see their numbers reduced. You want to see them increased, Mm -hmm. you know, and uh, we have to take care of them. And so uh, here I I had a painting then of the, continued with the acorns now, uh, the gall wasp laying its egg on the leaf. And then the the gall is the kind of uterus that's for the womb formed around this little egg laid by the gall wasp the leaf provides the womb and so the mother goes away and eventually the little larvae kind of pulls out of there and kind of eats its way out and is really another uh, gall wasp Mm -hmm. so it's really quite an amazing thing of the symbiosis that uh, well this uh, it benefits the health of the tree in some way does it not The, the gall wasp Uh, on the leaves, I've heard that, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, there are some trees that when a certain insect kind of lays its larvae on the leaves, uh, it will make the fruit sweeter. And of course, if the fruit is sweeter and more delicious, it's more likely to be eaten by a mammal, which will then spread those seeds miles away. Right. Um, So it's this nature is always seeking out companions. (laughs) Yes, it's a ways of forming friendships, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, look, you could take care of Junior for me, you know, all you'd have to do is grow a womb, you know? Yeah, <laughs> totally. Like, okay, well, you could build your nest in my tree. Yeah, you, know? you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Uh, yeah, yeah, like there's a, uh, you learn that cicadas are coming up, you know, and, and these uh, years, but look, the root systems of the trees actually need some aeration now and mm-hmm. then. They might need a little rain pu- uh, puddling down there to the roots and things. So it's it's part of the intelligent web of nature. Time to send up the locusts and give them a little aeration there, you yeah. know? And uh, so... Yeah, and, and I think to touch on it again, this is what the plant-based psychedelics are in the same way a flower admits a fragrance that attracts the pollinators. Uh, certain plants are producing chemicals that attract the monkeys and affects our behavior in a way that is favorable to the organism that created that chemical. Yeah, yeah. So it, it becomes a... Uh, kind of um, how to work out the most attractive uh, scents and uh, kind of uh, the best party going. Like, yeah, so here we, we have the really the symbolism of metamorphosis and uh, choosing the monarch is, is an easy choice because it's such a you know, kind of global symbol of the psyche, you know, and uh, the butterfly and the psyche, it's, that means the same thing in Greek. Mm, what do you mean? I think psyche uh, is uh, etymologically related to the butterfly. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. And so it's uh, this idea of the soul symbolization, you know, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross was commenting on it. Maybe you came across her comments too, but in the concentration camps with the children, they had little butterflies that they were, they had chalk drawn onto the walls. Mm. And so these, uh, the soul is naturally identified with the butterfly. And here we have the, the caterpillar, which uh, is eating its way to really oblivion. It's, it's kind of like consuming everything around it and everything and becoming this fat uh, thing. But it, then it, it's, it starts to change, you know, it hangs down there and becomes this 
chrysalis, mm -hmm. you know, so that the kind of metaphor goes, you know, that, you know, that we go through these different phases or alchemical uh, stages, I guess you could say, but a metamorphosis of our being. Mm -hmm. And at one point, you know, the old us, you know, is d basically digested by the new us, and uh, there has to be, uh, I, I guess they have a kind of poetry in the, the uh, what the, the butterfly that grows inside of the chrysalis is, I guess, called uh, the imaginal cells. Mm. And the imaginal cells uh, have to start to cluster together and things, you know, in order to build the butterfly body. And eventually, it overcomes the resistance of the of the lower self, I guess, mm -hmm. of, of uh, this caterpillar. And it's as it evolves a new capacity, you know. And so uh, then, at some point. Uh, the light comes and it and it's ready to uh, go on its own journey, you know, and it has to uh, give birth to itself. But it it has to squeeze out, you know, and it it's you know effort and will is part of the transformation. It's part of our of the completion, you know, of our, of our task as evolutionary beings, you know, that when we feel the the trap. You know, and we have become a new person. We have to escape, you know, from that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like the birth of, perinatal matrix. Totally. It's, yeah. you know, you're in number three, mm -hmm. you know, and you have to escape that world. Yeah. And of course, the butterfly will go back and pollinate the flowers of the plant whose leaves it ate so much of when it was a caterpillar, you know? Wow. So in, in the span of its life, there's this uh, reciprocity, you know, uh, a funny term that comes to mind uh, that Terence McKenna said that animals are just something plants invented to spread seeds around. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, it it's part of the intelligent web, you know. They're a medium. Although you could say they're looking for a ride or looking for a relationship or something like that. It's like God is working with them, you know, to find partnerships and codependencies, you know, that will allow for the survival of the many mm. and the benefit of the many. You know, it's like the, the root systems throughout nature being, you know, kind of intelligently networked together oh what do you need over there you know how can we help you know uh there's a there's a kind of you know recovery of that sense of altruism mm. that is in many of the systems that we discover in nature you know far from simply violently ripping each other apart and yeah. it's 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 not about the survival of the most violent it's about those who can adapt to the environment and those have to adapt with intelligence, you know? Yeah. It's, it's a, it takes a reimagining of what success is. Yes. You know, you could say the successful person is the person who makes a billion dollars, or maybe the successful person is the person who helps a billion people. What kind of billionaire would you rather be? You know, it, it, this idea of doing well by doing good. You know, your, your success should be intimately tied to the success of all of those around you. Again, connected into this network that you're in. How can you behave in a way that is successful on multiple levels for yourself, yeah. for your friends, for your family, for your community, for your nation, for your earth, for your solar system? You know, like it could conceivably expand out to encompass the entire universe that's how responsible you are like from an individual level you know well then out. you've reclaimed and recovered your true and whole being you know you've recovered your cosmic self and your imminent you know multi-dimensional self and you can see it reflected in the infinite web that of intelligence that is around us you know anybody you know with open eyes could see it science has opened our eyes mm -hmm. you know it's beautiful 
Well, Alex, thank you so much for um, opening up our eyes with the art you create. There's a little proverb that my grandma used to keep on her refrigerator growing up, and it read, by the time we're ready to get back to nature, nature might not be ready to get back to us. So thank you for creating art that aims to get us back to nature before it's too late. Hey, thank you, Tyler. Yeah, that's the point. That's what visionary art can do today. I, that's, I think that's one of the great tasks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's All great right. to talk with you today. Totally. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Happy Earth Day. Happy Earth Day. Yay. <laughs> Thanks for listening to this episode of the Cosm Podcast. If you enjoyed this audio-only conversation style, let us know in the comments, and remember to hit that like button. Consider exploring the Cosm shop to collect fine art and literature by Alex Gray and Allison Gray. All proceeds support the building of Entheon, Sanctuary of Visionary Art. Much love and see you next time.